Meanwhile, Do uh, President-elect Donald Trump is now tweeting yet again about the Electoral College. This after electors made his victory official on Monday. Mr. Trump uh, tweeted, and I quote, said tweet, campaigning to win the Electoral College is much more difficult and sophisticated than the popular vote. Hillary focused on the wrong states, exclamation point. He went on to tweet, I would have done better in the election if that is possible, if the winner was based on popular vote, but would campaign differently. And he went on to tweet, I have not heard any of the pundits or commentators discussing the fact that I spent far less money on the win than Hillary on the loss, exclamation point. To discuss all of this, one of those commentators of which the president-elect speaks, Washington Post reporter Ed O'Keefe, good enough to join me now, uh, from Washington. And Ed, uh, quite simply, what do you think is motivating the president-elect here? Uh, the idea that he generally sort of speaks out about this kind of stuff after the fact and, and, and uh, you know, still continues to believe that people aren't taking his victory seriously. And uh, he, he's perfectly within his right to feel that way. He probably would have campaigned differently if it were a popular vote election and not an electoral college election. Let's remember that he talked at the beginning about the idea of campaigning a lot more in California, in Illinois, in Connecticut, in New York. And if you were running a popular vote presidential election, that's pretty much the only places you would have to campaign. And, and maybe he would have done better, and maybe he would have surpassed her. We'll never know, because uh, it's, all, it's all in the past now. Uh, the idea, though, that he was campaigning in certain states to, to win electoral victories, everyone does that. That's why we see so much focus on Pennsylvania and Ohio and Florida and Colorado and places like that, because those are always the only states really ever seen to be in play. A popular vote presidential campaign uh, would be an interesting one, but that, that isn't the kind of contest we have in this country, at least not yet. Well, and it does seem uh, perhaps that we are uh, seeking to lend more import than there exists here, which is to uh, wonder, isn't this just another example of the president-elect's relatively thin skin? Yes, it is. All politicians have it, but uh, he certainly likes to uh, point his out by, by trying to settle scores this way uh, as clearly uh, as he does, whether it was Bill Clinton's comments yesterday or this today. Uh, yes, he has, he has thin skin. Uh, like I said, most politicians do. He's just a little more transparent about it, I think. Indeed. Uh, we're also seeing new questions now uh, arising surrounding uh, conflicts of interest that have uh, certainly been questioned now for some time. This time, uh, specifically, it's this post-inauguration fundraiser that has critics attacking the president-elect and his uh, adult children. What is exactly the issue here? Well, it looks like his sons were, were planning on having some kind of an event uh, that would bring uh, certain people access to them and, and possibly to the president-elect. It would have been for a very select group of people. Uh, it was built around the idea of, uh, of, of hunting, which is a passion of Eric and Donald uh, Jr. Uh, that is not normally what's uh, seen as permissible, uh, certainly in the midst of an inauguration, uh, no less. So for now, at least, the Trump folks say it's been scrapped. Uh, but it shows you that there are people around him who are still thinking that this is the kind of stuff that can go on. Um, look, they could try to do it, but they're going to face all sorts of questions about conflicts of interest and whether it's ethical and whether a president or his family should be doing these types of things. And um, they're going to continue to push the envelope, I think, and either their lawyers are going to step in or public opinion is going to step in and, and likely rein them back in a lot of situations. But the idea that children are involved in a presidency, I think it's important to remind people that is common. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been at least 14 or 15 presidential children through the years who have worked in one way or another in the White House. Uh, more than a dozen have served as, as ambassadors to other countries over the course of American history. The, the difference is that there are now nepotism laws in place that sort of lay out where exactly a child or a brother or a spouse cannot serve in the federal government. And we're going to see whether or not the Trump family tries to flout that or work around it and find the loopholes. And, you know, my, my answer to that is always uh, if people have issue with it, if public opinion is such that, uh, that, they're, uh, that they're seen in the wrong, then it's going to be on Congress. 
uh, or the administration to change those rules or to abide by them uh, the way that they've been abided by by other presidents in the past. Well, and it also seems as though uh, there's a greater element here that perhaps questions of conflicts of interest have replaced questions about when we might see tax returns beyond yep. the idea of, of the normal behavior of politicians seeking the presidency. I mean, you spoke of uh, adult children who have been involved in one way or another in the White House. You might be speaking of Ivanka Trump and her husband, Jared Kushner, there, but it's also been made clear that the adult sons will be given control of the family business. And to at least to this point, it does not seem as though uh, uh, words tossed off regarding blind trust notwithstanding that anything is going to change. In the in in the in the in the in the way that the Trump organization does business, exactly. And 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 until they clarify that and and show the American public what it is that they're going to do differently, uh, the, the, you know they're going to face the threat of of lawsuits uh, from opponents of the president uh, who are going to immediately try to challenge the constitutionality of his financial arrangements, the emoluments clause uh, of the Constitution, which forbids a president from from profiting from foreign entities by mere virtue of his current company and the way it earns money uh, there would be questions about that and so I think that's what we're told they're still sorting through and and we'll see how that goes uh, but certainly uh, it, it is uncharted territory and I think you know there, there continues to be concern about it my question is to, to what level of concern and will members of Congress or will others really try to do something about it if they don't like the way that the Trump family decides to arrange itself financially. And is, it has certainly returned a great word, emolument, to the lexicon, so we can be thankful Isn't it? for that. It is <laughs> terrific. Uh, in the wake of the attacks that we've now seen across Europe this week, uh, the president-elect's foreign policy is also squarely back uh, on center stage. Your colleague, James Homan, today writing about Mr. Trump's essential embrace of Richard Nixon's madman theory. Do you see the parallel there? Uh, I, to some extent, yes. And, and I think really on the first uh, test of this, when he took the call from the leader of Taiwan and China responded, you notice China responded but didn't uh, respond as aggressively perhaps as, as some may have feared in those initial hours after it was revealed that that call had come. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe Trump is on to something here. I think we'll see tests of this if indeed he immediately moves to uh, relocate the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, for example, and how the Palestinians would respond to that, how other countries would respond to that. If we see him take a dramatically different tact on China, on Russia, on how the U.S. engages with NATO, uh, you know, we'll just have to wait and see how the world responds. A lot of that may be uh, dependent on, on events at the time. I mean, right now, the situation in Germany obviously makes for a sensitive one there and probably puts Angela Merkel at greater political risk domestically. So you wonder whether she would be able to respond as forcefully to something she didn't like if he does it. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's clear uh, from his campaigning and from what we've seen during the transition that he's going to handle foreign affairs differently. It's going to be a little more cantankerous. That's what his supporters want and expect. And we'll just have to see how the rest of the world responds to it. We should note that the, uh, David Friedman, the man appointed to be the ambassador to Israel, is in favor of that move of which you discussed uh, from Tel Aviv to uh, Jerusalem. Ed O'Keefe of The Washington Post, as always, Ed, we do appreciate the insight. Take care, Josh.